Apollo and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is a distinguished scientist on the world stage. He's a professor at the London School of Economics, the director of the Centre for the Study of Global Governance, a member of the House of Lords, a nominated uh, member of the House of Lords, a peer with the Labour Party. I'm delighted to welcome Lord Meghna Desai. Uh, this is, you know, from the time that uh, you were a student, the, the, the nature and influence of uh, economics has changed. It has now sort of almost <coughs> become uh, the theology of public policy oh. and what you described as uh, social astronomy. Mm, indeed. So, so where does that, uh, in what ways does that def now define the role of the professional economist? Well, I think in the one sense the professional economist is a humbler person, you do not believe it, <laughs> because he believes that forecasting is not his job. We have failed in forecasts. We have got better in defining the theory required for policy. Mm -hmm. And we have paid much more attention to human behavior. We know that announcing rules and laws which go across human behavior are going to fail. So we know much more about why policy cannot be done from top down. So in a sense that has really just reaffirmed the principles of capitalism, isn't it? You know, one of the things that have happened uh, over the 20th century is that capitalism, to surprise of everybody, won the race against communism and fascism. Nobody expected that. Uh, I myself did not expect that when I was uh, a young man in, in my teens in India. In 1950s. <coughs> but also, capitalism has won because although everybody thinks it's full of crises and this and that, there has not been a big crisis since the Great Depression. So you had now 75 years of, uh, of you know, more or less uh, the steady growth. There are cycles and so on. And it has spread from the center, which are developed countries. Uh, everywhere. You also sort of uh, suggested that uh, you know Karl Marx is probably sniggering in his grave that, that he's been proved right. Absolutely. No, I, I've when when my party, my Labour Party, lost election four times in a row, especially after the third loss, I began to think why was it that while we were offering socialist policies, the British public kept on, re kept on rejecting us. Even the unemployed voted against us. Even the trade unionists voted against us. And thinking about that, I suddenly realized that we had completely underestimated the power and fascination capitalist success has on people, that people think capitalism can deliver. And socialism, by the same token, was not able to deliver. And when, finally, the USSR collapsed, I thought, what's here? Go back and Marx says, you know, capitalism will not come to an end until its full potential has been realized. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there's a lot more life left in capitalism relative to what all of us were told. And here we are, beginning of the 21st century, socialism nowhere in sight, and capitalism is thriving. So what does that uh, do to sort of uh, parties that uh, were on the left, like the Labour <sighs> Party in the UK that you're a part of? Uh, do you sort of then just sort of gravitate towards the middle ground? Uh, we have had to rethink the whole nature of democratic socialism. What can a socialist party do uh, in today's world? And not only has uh, socialism, as it were, been devalued, but because capitalism has entered the globalization phase, the state is less powerful today than it used to be. So what is it that socialism can do? What, what role can it now play? Or parties like the Labour Party, but ideologically. You know, parties like the Labour Party are right now saying that they still believe that a large part of public expenditure should go to health and education and that uh, the taxpayer should be persuaded to be willing to pay tax so that health and education can be kept in the public sphere. But at the same time, we have to allow choice. We have to allow them to, we have to, we have to kind of try and give them incentives mm -hmm. to behave rightly, to pay taxes, to make use of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the facilities. And the main battle right now in, in the UK, as far as uh, the right and left is concerned, is 
on the, on the kind of margins about the degree of choice in the public sector. How do you see that playing out in India, where you have a, a, a coalition government where uh, the left is, is a lot more left than the Labour sure, Party is sure, in the UK, sure, yeah. and you have uh, you know, things like the employment guarantee scheme, mm. um, which you have opposed and, and, and been very yeah, critical yeah, of. Absolutely. Uh, so how do you see this reconciling? Well, India, India is one of the few countries which are still a very large left uh, operating. Mm. And it is also intellectually much more powerful in universities and, and, um, and sort of academia. Why do you think that is so? Well, because, you know, they, the left aligned itself with Congress. Sometimes the Congress was able to humiliate the left, but the left mm -hmm. continued with that. And they occupy positions of power in universities, in economics teaching, in history, in science, and so on. And a certain kind of nationalist isolationist nationalist position was taken. But there obviously still is an intellectual appeal uh, oh, that it has enormously. Yeah, yeah. And, and what do you think that appeal is? Well, the appeal is people still somehow think that the left represents uh, the downtrodden, the poor. And in Indian history that is not true. Because if you think of the downtrodden as the Dalits mm -hmm. or the tribals or even the landless laborers, the left has always ignored them. The left has been for the state and for the public sector. The left has not really been uh, in, the, in the really big revolution in, the, in India in the 20th century was the Ambedkar Ramaswamy Naikar revolution, when the really downtrodden came up. And the Communist Party had nothing to say about that. The Socialist Party had nothing to say about that. And so, in a sense, there their reputation is somewhat exaggerated because if you think in terms of simple class then you may be persuaded to think that mm -hmm. communist party stands for the working class but if you say no, who are the working class who are the poor well communist party is for the organized working class in the public sector who are not the poorest who are not the most deprived they are the workers but they're not really the poor and so one big act of, uh, uh, as it were, persuasion somebody has to perform is to say, look, these are not bad people, but they're just wrong. Mm -hmm. They're stuck in the wrong philosophy, they're stuck in the wrong century. Mm -hmm. And right now, I think they're a big obstacle to acceleration of growth mm -hmm. and a big obstacle to the rapid removal of poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, do you predict uh, uh, for India sort of it's, in, it, it's the half the first decade of the new millennium is over and what do you see unfolding now? Well you know so far so good because I think what has happened in India is that despite nobody being publicly in favor of globalization or reform, reform is happening. Reform has gone into the bloodstream of Indian politics and party after party they go in and out of opposition into government and they continue that. A plateau has been established at six and a half percent growth rate. I don't think it's good enough. I think it should be better than that. Well, a plateau has been established. And uh, again, despite the rhetoric, uh, good sense is prevailing. Whatever people may say, they're they doing the right things. The difficulty is that the cost of slow growth is not borne by the people who are making the decisions. And the people who are, who are suffering from slow growth, they have no way of saying, well, you know, get on with it. So what they do, or their representatives do, is they throw boulders in the way to divert some of the surplus their way. Mm -hmm. So you have a Mayavati or, or a Lalu or, a, <coughs> or you know, some other kind of a leader. What they do, they say, okay, okay, we don't care about growth. Why don't you get some more money to my people? Mm -hmm. And that is not very healthy. You have argued for the, um, you know, to encourage the, um, you know, migration of rural populations uh, into the cities. In some ways, that seems sort of uh, antithetical to sort of, you know, the, the Gandhian notion that uh, you know you're writing a book on Gandhi. Uh, yeah. So, uh, how how do you reconcile uh, your sort of 
you know, your, your passion and commitment to capitalism and, 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 and to globalization and, and to the current approaches to economic management, uh, to your admiration for Gandhi. I've never at any stage said I admire Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Then what's prompted you to write a book? <laughs> I want to understand, I want to understand uh, the person. I want to write a book on the personal Gandhi, not on the public Gandhi. I want to understand how this perfectly ordinary person became a great man. Well, we'll come right back to that in a moment. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. You're watching a conversation with Lord Meghnath Desai. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Lord Meghnath Desai. Lord Desai, we were talking about uh, your admiration, uh, well, shall we say, interest uh, in the personal uh, Gandhi. Yeah. So what interests you about personal, uh, the personal Gandhi? And you, you've said that uh, you know, you, you, you've been amazed by the fact that uh, he was so attractive to women. Yeah. Uh, even though he was so sort of uh, austere and uh, in, in a loincloth and not a very attractive looking man in a traditional sense. Well, you know, uh, the private Gandhi is hidden behind a lot of the public stuff. You've got to go to, actually a lot of writing in Gujarati about Gandhi concerns you much more as a private person than in English. And I've been, I've been doing that. And the thing is, here is a person who... Uh, not only attracted women, but he attracted enormous amount of loyalty from people. To the very last day, people gave up all sorts of their own pleasures, their careers, their lives, uh, and not just uh, near relations, but uh, even, even kind of strangers. And he also a man who, throughout his life, fought against an aggression within himself. His, his big struggle uh, if you read his, his diaries and so on, was about his anger, his aggression, his sexuality. Because he had this strange idea that the world's ills were because of his imperfections. It's very strange, so it's sort of a Christian notion. You know, Christ died for our sins. It's not a sin, that Gandhi had to atone in his own behavior for the sins of the world. And if he was perfect, then the world would be all right. Which is why he went on testing himself. Can I control my senses? Can I, can I control my anger? Can, you know, why was he so worried about it? But mm -hmm. until the very end, a man who's supposed to be meek and mild and was well, from within seething with some kind of aggression, anger, sexuality. And I find that part is not discussed at all because we made him into a saint. And once we made him into a saint, he's a saint from the day he's born till ever. Whereas he actually constantly struggling uh, to get hold of himself, to be able to deal with people calmly, and there are all sorts of people dealing with him. In a sense, the you know the fact that he was uh, uh, transparent about processes yeah. that other people might mm. want to conceal is 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 what uh, possibly redeems him uh, from many of the you know, the feelings Absolutely. and processes yeah. that he went through. But why do you think uh, he was doing this? In a sense, uh, on the one hand, he is constantly examining himself, introspection all the time. That's sort of the, the, the essential of our ethos, mindfulness, to be, you know, to meditate on oneself, to be no, aware. No, but everybody writes it all down. The mm -hmm. thing is, you cannot expose any scandal about Gandhi because he has already exposed it. And any, the worst thing you can say about him, he has already said it. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing that you can bring out and because in his constant, obs you know, I wouldn't say well, you know, but constant need to self-examine, part of his con self-control thing, he just confesses and confesses and confesses. Again, it's not a very Hindu trait to confess. He's kind of a, has all these sort of Christian attributes, the best Christian attributes, I would say. But in a sense, very much the kind of idea that uh, in his own behavior, lies the good of the world. Mm -hmm. And he said it's not out of sort of conceit, but out of feeling somehow he is connected with the world and, and it's his responsibility. So isn't, the world that, is isn't that admirable? I mean, you said you don't entirely admire Gandhi. What is it about Gandhi uh, that makes you uncomfortable? Well, I can't think of myself doing any of those things, <laughs> first of all. Mm -hmm. I cannot I actually don't mind aggression or anger or sexuality. I think some of those things are there to be enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And a part of, part of the great human imperfection 
is that we enjoy these things. We enjoy our vices within control. Sometimes it gets out of control, mm -hmm. but that's what makes human beings interesting. Mm -hmm. If every human being tried to be like Gandhi, life would be a very dull place. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also worried that oh, I'm sort of, I'm also puzzled. At what stage does he get this idea that uh, the world somehow depends on his perfection? You know, it's, it's very, obviously everybody was saying to me, the Mahatma, and he, he moved millions and so on. But then this, this notion that somehow in his life and behavior, sort of mountains move or murders take place in the world, partitions happen, all because he is somehow at fault. Now, I find, you know, I much prefer Nero, who is a much more an imperfect person, mm -hmm. much more sensuous person, who enjoys himself. Mm -hmm. He makes mistakes, but he's a modern person. Mm -hmm. I, I can relate to, to him, but I can't relate to Gandhi at all. I just, I just find him, he leaves me cold, which is why I again and again want to know what explains this behavior. Mm -hmm. You've uh, done a book on Dilip Kumar and you've uh, written about him and, and, and said that uh, he epitomizes Indian manhood in some ways. Uh, so what draws you to Dilip Kumar? Well, again, I mean, Gandhi, uh, Nehru, well, Dilip well, Kumar, diverse well, characters. Well, I'm basically <laughs> trying to uh, decode my own life in India in the first 21 years I spent here mm -hmm. when these were the major influences. Uh, Nehru was the Prime Minister and we all kind of admired him. Gandhi died just when I was seven but he was kind of a big figure looming around. Mm -hmm. And Dilip Kumar was what kind of the person we wanted to emulate. His characters, you know, his behavior towards women, his behavior towards his rivals, his friends. We were picking up our ideals more from cinema than it is possible for people to well, understand. Well, it's reported that you, 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 you've seen the film Andaz at least sort of some 15 <laughs> odd times. Exactly. So what impact has Dilip Kumar had on you? How has he molded your personality <laughs> and character? We, we all sort of thought <laughs> we, we would be handsome like him, but we were not. But I think in a sense there is a degree of civility and uh, straightforwardness in his characters, all his characters. He never, never plays the anti-hero. He never played the criminal made good or the, the clever, the clever chappy who, who gets, by, gets away by cheating people. He never played characters like that. He's always a man of integrity, honor, kind of, you know, uh, some, somebody whose behavior you could follow and not come to grief. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that is neither Raj Kapoor nor Devan conveyed that kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And so Dilip Kumar was good, good for us. And he also played both urban characters and rural characters. Well, Dilip Kumar is someone you've uh, sort of, you know, stayed in touch with. Yes. So in what ways has he changed? I mean, he's now a senior citizen. He's not so yes. active. Uh, he, he's, he's no longer the, the, the persona that we've seen on television, no. or is he? Uh, well, I think, I think he still remains one of the most attractive human beings to talk to. I mean, I had a one-to-one -one with him in London, and he charmed an audience of about 500 people. Not all of them could even understand Urdu. Because A, there's his great voice, there's man. But I think also in, there is this amazing anger in the man because the world has not gone the way he wanted it to go. And how did he want it to go? Well, I think he's an Eruvian. He wanted, he wanted the world to be, to be kind of, you know, let's say, uh, secular, uh, friendly between communities, but also he wanted much greater honesty in dealings with people, much less corruption of money, much less commercialization, which is paradoxical because he's in a commercial medium. But I mean, he was even sort of muttering about the fact that this, uh, uh, the full color uh, mm -hmm. He wasn't quite sure that that was, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's what he would have done. But has, has the world unfolded as, as, as you would have liked it to unfold as, as a 21-year-old inspired by Dilip Kumar? No. In what ways? No. Well, you know, in a, certainly um, I had thought, uh, you know, Nehruji had told us that uh, as you grow up, economic growth, we'd get rid of costs and communalism and things like that. You know, have you naively believed it and it didn't happen? Uh, I had thought, uh, kind of mildly, uh, but more so in the 60s and 70s, that socialism would perhaps come. It's not going to come. Uh, 
India, I think, despite all that in the last 10 years, is better than it used to be in the previous 40 years. And I, I still have hope that India would become a decent, decent and prosperous place with very little poverty. But I think the fact that the world will not realize the ideals I had when I was 21, I find slightly you know, disappointing, but I feel one has got to grow up. You know, the ideals one had in one's 20s were probably not the right ideals to have. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to you, pick You've up. written saying that uh, uh, India's choice of democracy was more a matter of uh, polity than uh, the, the, perhaps the imperatives uh, of that time. What did you mean? Well, you know, we forget that in 1946, when the Constituent Assembly was meeting, very few countries were democratic. Indeed, France had given women the vote only in 1945. So to give adult franchise in a country full of illiteracy, full of caste division and so on, uh, when many wise people would have said, no, that's, that is too sudden, you know, you should slowly give uh, a franchise, maybe only to literate, only to men, you know, maybe not even to all men, you know, maybe only to caste Hindus and not <laughs> all those things. Instead of which the Constituent Assembly, which was not elected on a large franchise, a restricted franchise, took this very bold decision to go for adult franchise, not worrying about the illiterate voter. Do you applaud that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that is what fundamentally uh, <coughs> changed uh, you know, the Indian, Indian future, but also I think it, it changed the world because in a sense, uh, today when people are discussing can democracy be exported, of course democracy can be exported. India is the most successful example of how democracy, which is not a native Hindu or Muslim idea <laughs> to, to the Indian culture, was brought in from outside, has now been domesticated. And so India has made a democracy which is much more, much richer than Western democracy. But it has done it on, on its own. And I think that is that itself has caused other problems, but anyway, it's a democracy rather than not. I mean I remember when I was a, a boy in you know, in my teenage, people still saying ten years after the British had left, India needed a king. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or the British should be brought back. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now one would not think about that. We'll come to that in a moment. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. You're watching a conversation with Lord Meghnad, they say. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Lord Meghnad Desai. You've also said that uh, uh, you've talked about the, 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 the quality and, and the notion of Indian nationhood and said India yeah. is really uh, several nationalities. And what did you mean by that? Well, you know, I, I have, um, I was of course brought up uh, like many of us to think India was a single nation and anybody thinking not that, you know, was, was uh, wrong. But then uh, Malana Azad wrote this book, India Wins Freedom, and I began to understand how near India came not to have a partition, mm -hmm. and how, how it could be. And then the question was, what was India? Was India India as it is now, or India plus Pakistan and Bangladesh? Uh, what were the limits of this India? And I started looking at uh, problems of communalism, partition, and so on. And I realized that early on in the Indian independence movement, there was a notion, not just by the British, but the notion that India had lots of religions, lots of uh, languages, lots of regions. And India was a kind of a, a conglomerate of these different things. And the first roundtable conference, which took place in 1929, actually had representation from the Dalits and the women and the native states and, and the Parsis. And, the, you know, it was, and it was that roundtable conference which actually determined that India should be a federation. What implications does it have uh, for, for India? In, in well, you now? see, what the implication is, that although the way the history is now written, independence came only through Congress and Gandhi, the shape of the constitution came from a completely different source, mm -hmm. because the Government of India Act of 1935 was shaped as a federation. Congress wasn't for a federation. Mm -hmm. Muslim League was not for a federation. They wanted a unified, unitary state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thank God we kept that, because mm -hmm. in a sense the diversity of India mm -hmm. could not have been contained in a centralized state. Mm -hmm. And now the problem is, if India is a nation, in what sense it is a nation? 
Is it a Hindu nation like the BJP is saying? Is it a secular socialist nation? My view is that no. Indians have double or triple loyalties. They belong to language, belong to region, they perhaps belong to religion. They don't deny their Indianness. Isn't but the Indianness has to be negotiated continuously. Mm -hmm. And that's why these coalition governments mm -hmm. have become the norm. Mm -hmm. Because uh, no single notion of nationhood commands the loyalty of everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you were to sort of engage in, in, in political and economic soothsaying, yeah. and to some degrees economists have to do that, mm -hmm. uh, what would you say uh, about India in the next, say, five years, both in terms of the, you know, the, the unfolding of its coalition <coughs> governments, uh, in terms of its ability to manage the government, you know, the social astronomy, uh, manage, uh, make uh, economics the center stage mm -hmm. of uh, public policy? My dream ticket is a coalition, grand coalition, between Congress and BJP. My goodness. And I say <laughs> that, I say that for the following reason, that if you want to concentrate on just economic growth, rapid economic growth, then you need none of the smaller parties who are not interested in growth. They're interested in redistribution. They want, they want to take the surplus away somewhere else. Whereas for growth, what you need is a clear path for about 10, 15 years when we concentrate on getting growth, and that will get rid of poverty. And poverty will be got rid of not through the subsidies and distortions, but straightforward by creating jobs in the countryside, creating jobs in the cities. That needs a single-minded government. And that is not possible. A single mind is not possible. <laughs> a a double-minded government will do. Mm -hmm. And if that were to happen, I think the coalition, a two-party coalition, is a much easier thing to handle than a 15-party coalition. And it may actually be less corrupt, although I can't guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and what about uh, sort of, you know, the Lord himself, the Lord Desai himself? Uh, you're in your sort of, you know, mid-60s. Um, you've been an outstanding economist. You've, you know, written books on Dilip Kumar. You're working on a book on Nargis. You're exploring making a movie. What's happened to the economist in you? Well, you know, I did economics for 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will never give up economics, but I want to do other things. Mm -hmm. Because when I became an economist, I had to downplay my other interest. I had to get on a career. I used to act in theater in my undergraduate college days, and I was a film buff. But uh, wiser counsel said to me, look, forget all that. Just <laughs> get on with the job, you know, get a job, get a career study hard, you know, and then I became an economist, wrote articles, wrote books and so on, and became a professor. And now I said, okay, done all that, been there, got the t-shirt. Now, let's do something interesting in life. Mm -hmm. And I have myriad interests which I want to uh, explore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Film, music, drama, biography, mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. Does uh, uh, someone like you ever retire? No. I don't think retirement is possible. I, I, I have uh, people in my acquaintance who have retired. I'm just astonished. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my, my brothers and sisters are saying, why, why are you still doing this? But I can't stop. I, I've still got many more books to write. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've still got many more films to see. I've got many more films to make. Mm -hmm. So we shall see. Lodesai, thank you very much. This has been a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.